very pleased to have Mr. Southwell here today. As you can see, Mr. Southwell is a registered nurse. He works in nursing as a profession. And he has an AA degree from a junior college. He's also a real estate broker. He works in the real estate business as a profession. In addition, he has a political cause. And his political cause is, he in fact is the chief of staff of the Michigan Militia Corps. And he's going to talk about their activities as a social movement, as a political movement, as a constitutional movement. Mr. Southwell, my pleasure. Thank you. It's really uh, great to be here today. I really want to thank Mr. Henry for the opportunity to be here and talk to all of you, uh, especially uh, in these days, because uh, so often uh, in the colleges, in the schoolrooms, classrooms, uh, today we do not have that free speech. Uh, and I thank again Mr. Henry for the opportunity to share with you the uh, Founders' interpretation of the Second Amendment of, of, the, of the Constitution or the Second Amendment of those Bill of Rights. I want to let everyone know I'm not quite up to uh, par today. Uh, I got over the flu yesterday and uh, I'm still not 100%. So if all of a sudden you see me run out of the room, it's not because there was anything you said. I just had to go down and visit the, the, the bathroom down the hall. So bear with me uh, regarding that. I want to, as, as a member of the Michigan Militia Corps, I have one goal in being here today. And that one goal is to have you have a better understanding of what the Michigan Militia Corps is all about. And I will attempt to accomplish that by looking at the militia from a historical perspective, from the constitutional perspective, and then finally, why are militias rising up all over the country um, today? So to start with, and I'm going to have a time where I'm going to ask for any questions. I'd like to have the questions saved for the last, primarily because I want to make sure I hit all of the, the key points. Sometimes I get long-winded, and I understand I only have uh, 50 minutes or so, so I will make some th things short. Sometimes, uh, how many of you have seen any of the militia on TV? Donahue Show? What did you see it on? I just saw a documentary. On? Uh, I'm not sure. It was a while ago. Okay. Okay. Um, so we've been blamed or accused that we were on this show or on the news station, uh, and we didn't get our point across. Uh, the fear of why the militia is growing today. And uh, a lot of times when the news media portrays some movement, they don't always show uh, the reasons why. I think that's starting to cha change now. And uh, hopefully in the future there will be more clear reasons on why the militia movement is growing throughout this country. We need to look at the historical perspective of the militia. Um, up until about two years ago, I really wasn't clear on who the militia was or what the militia was. I thought maybe the National Guard was the militia. As I then went back and started reading and researching myself on what the militia was all about, I found out that it was in the 1600s that the original militia was formed. And it was strictly defense at that particular time. The, uh, the uh, colonies that were being formed did not have a military. They needed a way of defending their community. They did it through the militia. And the militia amounted to the citizens who were armed that were willing to serve to defend the community. By the 1700s, the militia was still in effect. And the citizens were still armed. By the 1770s then, Britain, realizing that the militia still had a great deal of power, made an attempt to disarm the militia. Uh, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with Lexington and Concord. Okay. I didn't realize until just recently how that all came about. But the British were on their way to Concord to collect the weapons. In those days, the weapons were kept in an armory in town. They kept the shot and the powder and, and the arms in, in a building. 
And when the citizens needed it, they went to the armory and got the, the weaponry, the arms, and then used them to defend their community. The British, realizing that in order to keep the colonists under control, they had to get rid of the weapons, the arms, they were on their way, approximately a thousand, I want to say, there may have been more, a thousand British soldiers on their way to Concord to collect the weapons. On their way, they had to go through Lexington. And there was a, a small group of militia men in, in uh, Lexington that uh, had gotten their arms, and they stood in the green, in the center of town, when the British came. And, and they stood there, and they didn't know what they were going to do. They just more or less was standing there taking a stand regarding uh, their arms, and the British told them to go home, and they said, we're not. The British told them, put down your arms. They said, we're not going to. And then we heard that famous shot that was heard around the world. Uh, they don't know who shot the first bullet, but somebody did. And, and there were um, um, many, a few, I think there was a half a dozen or so that died on the green there in Lexington. The British went on their way to Concord. And at that time, when they got to Concord, the arms were gone. They went to the armory and... The militia had already cleaned out the, the arms that were in the armory. And now the British had to get back to Boston. On their way back to Boston, they had to go back through Lexington. And that's where the militia had then turned into an army. The militia then went from up front standing in Lexington Green to being underground. And they, in fact, ambushed the British. And I think, believe over a hundred British soldiers died as the British tried to get back to uh, Boston. That's the historical perspective on who the militia was. They were open and up front. They were a defensive, strictly a defensive mode until they became an army. Historically, then, that's where it's at. What about constitutionally? From the the Declaration of Independence until about 1787, this country was uh, under the Articles of Confederation. Um, once again, and I didn't realize and understand all of this until the last couple of years. I'm 44 years old, and uh, I just, I don't know where, I, I, I didn't understand all of this early on. When I went through school, even when I went through school, they didn't, either I, I got through without learning it or I got through without listening to it. But the Articles of Confederation was a loose-knit, independently, independent states that cooperatively got together. They cooperatively fought the Revolutionary War. And by 1787, they realized that the Articles of Confederation was not doing too well. At that time, then in 1787, Many of the leaders in the country felt they needed to get together to write a constitution. Well, others in the country decided that they didn't want to write anything else. They wanted to keep what they had. There was a great fear in this country that if a group of politicians got together that they would trash the Articles of Confederation and write something that would give the... Uh, federal government too much power and too much authority. They were already frightened of a, a government with too much power or too much authority. That was what was uh, had occurred in Britain. So the politicians of the day said, well, listen, we're going to get together, but we will not rewrite the Articles of the Confederation. We're just going to sit down and, and get together and kind of talk about the Articles and try to improve on them a little bit. That was the pretense. Patrick Henry, you all, does everyone know who Patrick Henry was? Patrick Henry? Give me liberty, give me death. You remember that? I don't hear, I don't see many heads shaking yes. Anybody? Anybody remember Patrick Henry? Raise their hand. One, two, I know there's a couple. Somewhere in here, I just put it away. I need to. I need, I'll pull that out and, and read that quote that he was famous for. And I, apparently the history books have been rewritten when you went to school from when I went to school, but it was a very important uh, statement that he had made there. But Patrick Henry refused to go and participate 
in this convention reviewing the Articles of Confederation because he was frightened that they trash the articles and they would write something else. Does anyone here know that what's going on in the state of Michigan throughout this country, at least over the last couple of years, was a constitutional convention? That has been going on over the last couple of years. Now they have eliminated the constitutional convention uh, idea, and now they're just going to get together to discuss the Constitution, not to change it. How many here have ever heard the idea that if you don't know history, you're bound to repeat it? Have you heard that? Yeah. And all of a sudden, in 1787, Patrick Henry is saying, don't meet. If you gentlemen meet to talk about the Articles of Confederation, you're in fact going to trash it and write something brand new. Now in 1995, the same thing's happening. We need to meet and talk about our Constitution, not to trash it, just to kind of talk about it and improve upon it. So many citizens are real frightened of this Constitutional Convention or this, this other uh, vague, uh, Kim, what's the name of it? Well, it starts out as a resolution of participation. Okay, resol To meet and have a conference of the states. Changes names a lot. So, so there's a, the idea that they're not meeting to to change the constitution. Just kind of talk about it, about it. So the states are doing that now. So what happened then in 1787 when all these people got together? They trashed the Articles of Confederation and wrote the Constitution. They did then go back to all the states and say, listen, because we've got such a poor confederation, we need a stronger federal government to be able to get things accomplished, to be able to have the force and the strength that we need to stay together as a nation. So the Constitution was born, but we did not have the Bill of Rights. And we would not have a Constitution today if those politicians did not promise that they would pass as their first job the Bill of Rights, those first ten articles, or those two first ten amendments to the Constitution. Patrick Henry argued and debated over the Constitution. He didn't want the Constitution at all. He wanted to keep the Articles of Confederation. And in Virginia, when they debated on whether to pass the, the, the uh, Constitution or not, he said, what about your arms? How are you going to defend yourself against tyrants if you don't have your arms? And in the debate, they said, well, no problem. If you have a tyrant, you just have to re-elect a new person to govern you. And Patrick Henry said, Oh, how easy it would be if all we needed to do to get rid of a tyrant is to elect someone else. He said, Your power, your arms are gone. Your arms are gone. Without your arms, you cannot be able to defend yourself as a people, as a free people. So with that, as it was debated throughout all of the states in the country, they did pass the Constitution, understanding that the Bill of Rights would in fact be passed as the first job in, uh, in our Congress. But what was the Constitution all about? The Constitution limited the federal government. It limited the federal government. It didn't give them free reign. It limited the federal government. The Bill of Rights then documented the limitation. And the Tenth Amendment, the very last amendment of the Bill of Rights, states something to the effect that whatever authority has not been specifically spelled out to the, to the federal government is reserved for the state and or the people. That's what the Tenth Amendment was all about. Right now in our, in our state, is anyone familiar with the Tenth Amendment resolution that was passed last year in our state? Probably not. You don't read that in the media. Let me read one sentence out of it. This passed in our state um, House and Senate last year. It passed the Senate passed the House um, in September, it passed the Senate in December. 
This was a resolution that was passed at the state level instead of the sent to the federal level. I won't read it all, but let me just read one statement. And again, this is, these, this is the kind of thing that's been passing all over the country regarding states rising up and telling the federal government you stepped over your constitutional authority. Resolve that we hereby memorialize the federal government as our agent to cease and desist effective immediately mandates that are beyond the scope of its constitutionally delegated powers. That's our state telling our federal government back off. You stepped over the line. There's a Bill of Rights, the Tenth Amendment, that tells you you've got to be limited in your power, and you stepped over. How many have heard, I believe it was last week, at the federal level, the uh, federal government is now stepping back off of their federal mandates when they aren't putting any money behind it. The federal government is starting to get frightened of the people. It's starting to get frightened of the states. Montana is talking about secession. Colorado was planning on, and I don't know if they've done this or not, Colorado State was planning on introducing in their legislation a, a, the idea that they were going to collect all the federal income tax, that they take out their money from the mandated programs and give the federal government the rest of the money. Isn't that interesting? Kind of a turn of events. Right now, we give them our money to the federal government, and then we beg them to give it back to us. So those kinds of things are changing. So during Patrick Henry's time then, in the seven, late 1780s, he debated and many others debated that we needed these Bill of Rights to keep our federal government in check, to keep our federal government under control. But through the erosion in this country, we as a people have allowed our Constitution to be trashed, and particularly the Bill of Rights, the Tenth Amendment being one. The Second Amendment is the right to bear arms. Mr. Andy, where are those? Yeah. And I don't have the Second Amendment memorized. I should, but I don't. And it's in this first page here, the constitutional um, wording. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The right of the people to keep and bear arms. I thought the militia was the National Guard. Who thought the militia was the National Guard? Come on. Good. That's all right. Couple, who, who else? All right. Anybody? Nobody. Just a couple. The militia is part of the National Guard. After the um, Constitution was ratified and the Bill of Rights were adopted, I believe that was in 1788, the government then established who the militia was, and the militia was the people. It was the, um, the Militia Act of 1792, I believe, and that stayed on the books until about 1908 when the president uh, at the time, maybe it was 1916 at the time, the president said the Militia Act is null and void. In fact, the militia being of the people, the people hadn't prepared or armed themselves, so the National Guard was established. So the militia, in fact, in, uh, uh, in writing are, is twofold. The militia is the organized and the unorganized branch of the militia. The organized militia is the National Guard, or at least it used to be. I would argue that the National Guard is no longer the, the uh, organized militia, only because as the National Guard became part of the United States military, then by definition it didn't qualify as the militia, because the militia was established so that people could defend themselves from a tyrannical government. And if the militia is under the control of the federal government, we need to go back. Do you think the militia of 1776 was under King George's control? No, it was under the people's control. But, but the, the legal term, the militia is defined as the unorganized and the organized. The organized is the National Guard. But again, over recent years, because the National Guard has been turned over 
to our federal government or has been federalized, I would argue that the National Guard is not even a militia anymore. But again, um, still on the books and by definition, the National Guard is part of the militia. It's the organized part. The unorganized part is everyone else. Everyone else. Everyone in this room. That's who the unorganized militia is all about. The militia has always been defensive. Always been defensive. As I said earlier at Lexington and Concord, it changed from being defensive to offensive when the war started. The militia is not an offensive army. The militia is neighbor helping neighbor. It's that simple. It's neighbor helping neighbor. The Second Amendment, well, I'm looking at my notes here. How many here believe the Second Amendment, according to our forefathers, had anything to do with hunting? Okay, we're going to get to that. Good point. Um, and at the, later on, well, uh, don't let me forget that, all right? Okay. It was always defensive. The militia is defensive. And um, it is, has, had nothing to do with, the, um, uh, with hunting. The militia was always very, very open and up front. It was so open, they kept all their arms at an armory. Well, they didn't keep them necessarily at home. They kept them in the armory, the building in town. So it was very, very open. So constitutionally, then, it was passed, and it was on the books. And until recently, the, the militia's kind of just been out there. And we, the people, are the militia. Legally, constitutionally, historically, we, the people, have an inalienable right to defend yourself. That's a God-given right that no human being or political entity can take away from you. And if I come over to you and I start hurting you, you have a right, a God-given right to defend yourself. The police can't do it. There's documentation as people have tried to sue the police because they didn't protect them, the court says, no, no, no. The police can't protect you. It's your responsibility to protect yourself. The police department and the prosecutor's job is to pick up the pieces afterwards to find out who did the harm and then to prosecute them to the full extent of the law. We have a responsibility, a God-given right, and a constitutional right to always defend ourselves to keep ourselves free. So what's happened then from, from 1792 until today regarding the, um, the militia? Nobody knew about it. It wasn't out there. I mean, it was out there, but nobody knew about it. So what happened? There are things happening today that are frightening, frightening the American people. And that's why the militias are rising up. In... November 1993, I met with one other individual, and I said, you know, based on what I've read and what I'm frightened about, I want to be prepared to defend myself. Do you feel the same way? And are you willing to protect me? I'm willing to protect you. Neighbor helping neighbor. He said, yes, he would. So what ends up happening then is we let the word out. We're going to form a militia. Who's interested in forming a militia? A neighbor helping neighbor defensive group. And all of a sudden we found another person. Then we would meet. By February there were 15. By the end of April we actually formalized the Michigan militia. It was one county, Emmett County, that's the county where Petoskey and Mackinac City, uh, Harbor Springs are. That was the, the militia that was formed. Then we went public in May and said, we're a defensive unit. We were trashed in the news media short and very shortly. And, and at that time, uh, my primary profession was real estate. And uh, I was fired from uh, my job. 
because I was so involved in a militia. Oh no, I wore camouflage and I was training and I have an arm and it's not an Uzi, um, but it is a semi-automatic and it would be defined as an assault weapon. In my hands, it's an assault weapon. If the police or the army have it in their hands, you know what it's called then? A defensive weapon. Explain to me why when I'm holding this weapon or this arm, it's called an assault weapon, but if I take that same arm and give it to the police or give it to the, the military, it's now a defensive weapon. That's probably because the gangs gave us that reputation. Okay. She's partly right. I would agree with that. The other part that goes along with that is the news media has done that. How many here believe assault weapons have been banned in this country? Okay. One. Most of the time people will say, yeah, because that's what they read in the paper. The, the crime bill banned the assault weapons. It didn't. There was a grandfather clause. All existing assault weapons are still legal. But the news media would give you the impression that assault weapons have been banned. So what's the fear today? The fear can, you know, I can go on for hours, so I'm going to hit some, cop, some key points, and then I'm going to open up the questions. The court system. And I'm glad you're going to have a judge here next week. The court system, it used to be until 1895, and ask your judge this when he's here, or she, he is here. Up until 1895, the jury decided on the guilt of the individual and also, also decided on the, um, the law itself, on whether it was right or wrong. There was a little booklet out, and I don't, I, I, I keep giving my copy away, but it talks about William Penn, and I believe William Penn was on a jury, and he spent time in jail in the 16 or 1700s, because he said in a court of law, as a juror, he said that law is unjust. And the court system said, you can't judge the law, you're only to judge the individual. He says, I can't. Our country, when it was founded, that jury system, and the reason it was established for, for our peers, was so that if there was an unjust law, the peers could say, wait a minute, this is an unjust law. We're going to let this guy off because the law is unjust. In 1895, a hundred years ago, that changed. Now the jury is told, you can't judge the law, you can only judge the individual. Well, that isn't what this country was established or founded on. We as a people can judge that law. Now, somebody's going to say, well, go to the Supreme Court. Do you know what the average court case costs to get to the Supreme Court? When you get to the Supreme Court, the average court case costs $250,000 if they decide to hear your case. Up until 1895, your neighbors decide whether that law was just or not. And believe me, we have unjust un, um, laws on the books, and people are being imprisoned because the people have, do not have the right. Ask that judge that. Ask that judge about 1895. You will find that most judges and lawyers didn't get that kind of a history. I've talked to judges about that. The federal police force is out of control. I've got a little, one article here. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Randy Weaver or um, Ruby Ridge, Idaho. There was an individual that uh, some claim he was a white supremacist, some claim that he was a white separatist. I don't know who he is. All I know is what the federal government did to him. The federal government set him up on a gun charge, selling a shotgun too short, the federal government told him that they would drop that charge if he would go undercover into some white supremacy group and be a, an informer. He refused to do that. They brought <coughs> charges for selling that sawed-off shotgun. He refused to go to court because it was a trumped-up charge. Well, not a smart thing to do. So the feds came in after him. His 15-year-old son was out with the dog. The dog was barking. 
understand these individuals were frightened of our government, frightened of our fed, federal police force, and they were usually armed when they were on their property. And the dog took off running after somebody. The boy went after the dog. Somebody shot the dog. The boy shot the person that shot the dog. And Mr. Weaver calls his son home, and the last words his father ever heard his 15-year-old son say is, Daddy, I'm coming. And a federal police officer shot the boy in the back and he died. The gentleman and his wife and his other children were held hostage in their home. His wife, while holding their infant son, was shot in the head by a federal agent, dropping the child to the floor and died instantly. Because the American people have risen up and have asked why the news media is not doing it, finally they did an investigation. This is an article out of the Wall Street Journal. I don't have to usually use these except when the ladies for it, right? One of the most disturbing aspects of Mr. Free's slap on the wrist last week is the treatment of Larry Potts. Larry Potts was the, the uh, federal agent in charge of the, the Randy Weaver situation. Mr. Freeze is the director of the FBI. Or, yeah. Mr. Freeze picked as acting deputy FBI director, Mr. Potts was the senior official in charge of the Idaho operation and signed off on the shot without provocation orders. In other words, Mr. Potts again was the gentleman in charge of and he said go ahead and shoot without provocation out there in that area despite the finding now this is what the justice department found despite the finding by the justice department that the orders violated the constitution free recommended that the only penalty mr potts face be a letter of censure the same penalty mr free received when he lost an fbi cellular telephone that's what they decided the weaver case is by far the most important civil rights civil liberties case the clinton administration administration has yet resolved and it resolved it in favor of granting unlimited deadly power to federal agents if the new Repo republican congressional leaders let the justice department and the FBI get away with that, with what may have been murder, they will accomplish, they will be accomplices to a gross travesty of justice. That's frightening the American people. That happened back in 92. That is frightening the, the American people. There has been an armed assault on a land um, protester up in the UP. How many of you heard that? gentleman by the name of Dick Deline. He's got 2,400 acres and he put some ponds on his property. And for months and for years he had been building this. Then the law changed. They denied that he could continue to work anymore. He had gotten awards from environmental groups. But the government at the state level told him not to do it. And he started fighting them through the court system. He's gone through three lawyers and $150,000 and he had an armed assault at his house. They broke down his gate, came to his house, and said, and these were camouflage SWAT team people at his house. The only reason no one was hurt there, I'm convinced, was because uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Deline's lawyer got involved and came out. Probably the biggest fear that I have, and I'm going to end with this, and there's many others, but I want to open the questions. The biggest fear that I personally have is the economic demise that this country is looking is that's going to occur. In 1985, our country got the best uh, business minds together under one commission. It was called the Grace Commission. And they said, based on what we're doing now, what can we do to balance the budget? They did that in 1985. The Grace Commission said, listen, here's several ways you can attempt to balance the budget. Number one. Number two is, is here's the trend. Here's where we are now. By 1996, it's a date of no return. We will be in such an economic calamity that there's no going back. 
and we will be in an economic collapse in this country. 1985, they passed the Graham Rudman Hollings Act. Anybody know what that is? It's a balanced budget act. They passed that in 1985. <coughs> well, why are we debating a constitutional amendment, balanced budget amendment? Because they put so many loopholes in it in 1985, they don't have to balance it of the budget. Even if they had passed a balanced budget amendment today, there would have been so many loopholes in it, they still wouldn't have balanced the budget. We're, we're at a trend of deficit that we are going to have an economic collapse, I believe, and this is why I'm involved in the militia, that we're going to have anarchy in the streets. And I want to be able to defend my community, and the militia is going to be prepared to do that. If we have rioters, anarchists coming in to harm the citizens in our community, the militia will be there to defend our, ourselves. Those are the fears. How can the militia dissolve if you as citizens are frightened of the militia or would like to have it go back to where it was, back at home, nobody talking about it, nobody um, dressing up and training, get your news media to do the research. Tell me that my fears regarding the economic collapse are wrong. That I won't have to defend myself. Because I'm not going to trust my government to do it. That's my responsibility to do that. As the news media shows, if anyone, and I have talked to over two dozen news media, whether it's Time Magazine, the New York Times, Chicago Det Tribune, or the Detroit Papers, not one paper has done an article on the, the economy of this country. I said, that's what's frightening me. You want me to, to quit what I'm doing and go home? Show me, show me that I'm wrong, that my fear is unjustified. And I'll go home. I'd rather, I'd rather still be working full time in real estate instead of getting fired. Then I tried to get a job back in nursing at a hospital in Bethesda that I worked at 10 years. I can't get a full time job back there. So there's discriminatory practices against the militia. But I'm not a, the militia is not a protected class, so uh, that's, that's, uh, that's life, I guess. So with that, I'll throw it open to questions, and I guess I'll go back to this lady and the Uzi. There can, it can be debated on whether the militia has the right to have an Uzi or not. And some people believe that we as a people, in order to protect ourselves, should have all the weaponry that the government has. If you go back to 1776, the citizens had the same weaponry as the government had. So some will debate that they need an Uzi in the militia because the government has Uzis. And part of what we need to do is protect ourselves from the government. That's not my personal stand. My problem with an Uzi when I think of it in terms of militia, it's a waste of bullets. I would just as soon have a semi-automatic, I don't need an Uzi. And if the debate is that an Uzi, the government has an Uzi, so I should have an Uzi, and I've had this people argue this, then doggone it, the militia should have tanks and cannons, everything that the government has. So I, I can't get into that debate, and, and I have no problem with, with uh, outlawing Uzis. Um, but others in the militia would argue that point based on having the same thing that the, uh, uh, the federal government has. Again, we're going, getting back to people are frightened of our government because of the erosion of our Constitution. Did you want to follow up with that? Did you want to follow up with anything about the Uzi? Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. What agency was that? The Dick Deline was the um, uh, DNR, state police, and the sheriff. He personally felt the sheriff was the one that really um, uh, was at the head of that. But I, I don't know. Um, well, what, what they had was a, an illegal search warrant. And uh, once the, the police were told that, they said, oh, we're sorry, Mr. Deline, we'll go home now after they held him hostage for three hours. Now somebody will say, well, no problem. Uh, Dick DeLine can take the state police to court. But understand, he's still tied up and he's $150,000 in the court costs dealing with the DNR over the wetlands issue. 
He was charged with violating the Wetlands Act. He put in uh, some ponds in his, in his Upper Peninsula 2,400-acre swamp. He basically, he built these swamps, sw uh, swamps, ponds, and I mean, the man even brought in lime rock. He had, he's got great documentation. Well, what was he arrested for? Not putting in the, in the oh. ponds. Basically, you need a permit. Uh -huh. The DNR has to prove everything. And you're not supposed to disturb the wetlands. Oh, and they feel he did. And they feel he did by putting in ponds. He well, the and, and that's not illegal. Doing it without a permit is illegal. Doing it without a permit. And he had been doing it before the law was passed. And the oh. DNR said, oh, hey, why don't you just put in a, for a permit? He put in for a permit. His lawyer said the DNR didn't respond within six months, which means if they don't deny you in a six-month period, you have permission then to do, continue on. He continued on until he had a different run-in with the DNR, and then they went out to get him. And that's when then they uh, told him to stop what he was doing and went after him. Oh, they, they, he feels that they were out to get him right from the beginning. He doesn't feel that way, no. based on what he's told me. He had another run-in with the DNR over a job that he was hired to do. And uh, he was in a difficult situation where he was hired by someone to do the work. The DNR told him to stop doing the work. He said, I'll stop doing it if you give me an injunction. And they said, well, we don't need to. You just need to stop. But he was under contract to get the job done. If he didn't get the job done, he would be liable to the person that did the hiring. And the DNR never came in with an injunction. So they came around the other direction. At least that's what's going on up there. Um, other questions? Yes, sir. Do you think uh, the militia, uh, should there be other, I don't know, branches of the militia across the country? There are. Right now, um, from our lead in, in Emmett County, there are about 70 counties, 70 out of our 83 counties, establishing militias here in Michigan. And virtually every state um, is forming some type of militia. And, um, you know, it's spreading lot, you know, beyond our, you know, we were just some people who live in Emmett County. And I, I live, you know, on 20 acres in a small community. But nobody believed. Excuse me, nobody believed that you could do this constitutionally. That's how you wrote it. We believe our Constitution has gotten. We've been told since day one that we we're going to be arrested, killed, assassinated, harassed. Well, we've been harassed to some extent. We just went through, there was a big uproar throughout the country that uh, the Justice Department was going to be arresting militia leaders um, Saturday, actually all last week, all over the country. And uh, there's a great deal of fear. So the movement is broad uh, spread throughout the whole country. And, and I just want to address, too, um, as you read through that militia uh, manual, I've been accused of being a racist. I've been accused in an uh, uh, organization out of the Southern Poverty Law Center called Klan Watch of meeting with somebody from the Aryan Nation who's supposed to be in the Aryan Nation. And I don't know who this person is. But... Uh, Michigan law says that the, the, the accused, when somebody writes libel about an individual, you've got to give them until the next publication. And I'm in the process of getting that se second publication, and I will be suing this organization. We are not discriminatory. We want everyone who is interested in defending their rights to join the militia. And this is what I tell people, because this is so basic and so simple. If I am frightened and there's somebody there at my house that's going to rob me, if there is a Randy Weaver situation with the federal government, he's got my house surrounded, they've shot my son and my wife, if I have five people come to my house to defend myself, and two of them are women, one's a black person, and the other two are white, middle-aged, fat guys, you think I'm going to say, no, I only want the white, middle-aged, fat guys here defending the blacks and women go home? Absolutely foolish. No. 
Anybody? We've got a lady that's 87 years old in the militia. But she, she doesn't own guns, but she has to her attack knitting needles. And if she's willing to come to my house to defend my house, I want her there. You know, we do have Jews. We do have blacks in the militia. It's interesting, in Detroit, there's a black militia rising up, independent of ours. It's the, um, I can't think of the first name, it's the, the something Darby militia. And it's a black militia in the Detroit area. They're preparing to defend their communities. Against yes, sir. What? Against, it can either be, it can be, it can be, it can be anything. It can be against abuse of federal agents. It can be, be abused. It can be from uh, um, rioters. It can be any number of, of things. Yes, sir. So there's no cohesion between any of these units around the country. There's no set uh, national agenda for these units. No, not so at this not at this point. There's isn't anything like I don't know, just tribal to me. Uh, just local geographic, geographical areas getting together. And, Yes. So, I mean, sort of independence from uh, centralized urban government. If we look at it from a historical perspective, where again it was neighbor helping neighbor and it was a community based, understand that once a war broke out, then all of those militia units got together. Right. Washington had a heck of a time because they were all these independent groups and independent thinking and trying to get them to be a cohesive group. Mm -hmm. There are some. There are many in the state that are following our lead, but there are also others independently and throughout the country it's the same way. Because well, we all have different in philosophies to some extent. So I see I see that's that's my point, is that there's so much difference, there's not a, a, co a cohesion or a unity of one purpose. It seems to me that everyone's addressing their own individual agenda, which means I think a lot of problems. Yeah, but too many people saying, well, we've got our own special interests and we need to have this address. So northeastern Michigan or, you know, yeah, northern yeah, Michigan yeah. has their own militia and Detroit has their own militia and soon there'll be a West Coast militia or whatever. But what, what are their, what's their premise, though? It's all to defend the Constitution. If that's what everyone is there for, if that's what the militias are there for, is to defend the Constitution, how that's accomplished there are also very more active political groups, patriot groups out there that are going towards that political agenda. This is a very basic bottom line issue of defending our own community. And uh, yeah, we network with each other. I will be, um, uh, I've gone down and spoken in Detroit and Grand Rapids all over the state. Uh, this summer I'll be going to Wisconsin. Um, to speak to a group out there that want to form a militia. We had a group from Milwaukee come here to talk to us. So there's not, understand that the whole idea of the militia is independence. And once you start coming up with all these rules and regulations, you know, then you really fragment too many different ways. So the main idea, the main goal is defending and supporting the Constitution. Uh, whether we're Democrat or Republican, most of us say, oh, you're this far right group. Recently in our state house, we, the Senate just passed a resolution, I think it's HR, I want to say 26 or 27, allowing search and seizure without a warrant as long as the police officer believes what he was doing was constitutional. Every Republican, every Republican voted for that. And every Democrat voted against it. And where did the militia fall? with the Democrats, because it's unconstitutional. It's real clear. Because the, a police officer may have never read the Constitution. So he goes in and busts in somebody's door and grabs something, and in the court he says, yeah, I thought I was constitutional. Yeah, have you ever read the... In, um, I don't know what to call it, built-in, um, for, for police abuse. Yeah. Where they have to really abuse that law. Exactly. And severely abusing that law. And that's what's frightening people into forming militias. Those kinds of things. Those kinds of things. And that's why the militia is rising up all over the country. Because in order to turn the country around, we're going to have to let the politicians know 
that they need to be frightened of us. Because they can selectively pick out a person that they're, um, they, they really don't have um, a, a real warrant, a real reason to go into their home, and they can make a one. Because they so don't like you. And they can pick on that person, and the, and the guy down the street who's doing 10 times as much, they can turn their head to him, and that's, that's, that, that is unconstitutional, that law is very unconstitutional. Okay. And she, she's absolutely right. And it happens. People don't want to believe that some people are, are um, used as examples or some people are people like this kind, but it happens every day. Right. That's right. What, the reason I think this law passed, and I, I, I'll shut up. Go ahead. I think you guys got another closet to go to. I really appreciate again for your time and your courtesy, and I again thank Mr. Henry for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Mr. Southall. Do you have any questions?